So, in your mind, fast high-level forecasts are preferred from an agile perspective because the scope hasn't been fully defined. Keep that in the back of your mind when answering Agile-related questions that may pertain to cost. In the same token, as it pertains to schedule, you should remember that in the world of Agile, adaptive approach, your short cycles, your sprint is not going for years on end, at best for weeks. So, these short cycles provide rapid feedback on the approaches and suitability of deliverables and generally manifest as iterative scheduling and on-demand pull-based scheduling. Remember the importance of looking at pull-based systems instead of pushing work on people that is also something to think about. Think about flow-based Agile, Kanban, iteration-based Agile, the world of Scrum, and understand how scheduling could be done in iterations and in adjusting the time approach when it comes to flow-based. When it comes to quality, quality is built into the processes of Agile within a Scrum framework. The constant iterations enable check-in periodically, not just in sprint reviews, but you need to remember that sprint retrospectives are also a perfect way of self-inspection within the team that is also part of quality. So it's important to remember quality in Agile is built in. During retrospectives, the team regularly checks on the effectiveness of the quality process. They look at the root cause of issues then suggest trials of new approaches to improve quality. When it comes to scope management from an agile perspective, you should remember your product backlog can change according to EAF's enterprise environmental factors. Factors in the enterprise or factors that are in the marketplace could wildly affect your product backlog sometimes might negate so many of those stories in your backlog. When it comes to integration from an Agile perspective, you should remember that the team is front and center, not the project manager, because there is no project manager theoretically in the world of Scrum. So, in the world of Scrum, using it as an example, integration is done by the team. Managing project changes is also important but remember, if you want to change anything within the sprint, it has to go through the product owner and changes during the sprint are forbidden, generally. Could they happen? They could but they must go through the product owner. Remember that changes to any part of the product backlog must be approved first of all by the product owner if it is going to be done. With that said, anyone can add to the product backlog. But once the product backlog has been prioritized, once you get an idea of what to be done in the next sprint, those ideas should be held in place as much as possible and any changes must go through the product owner. It is a very powerful role. It is a role that should be respected. And if there's no respect for the product owner, there could be problems. You could get questions that really test your understanding of these roles. I want to encourage you, if you have not already done so, do read page 40. Page 41 in your Agile Practice Guide page 40 starts off with Agile roles. In Agile, three common roles are used. It reads cross-functional team members, product owner, and team facilitator. Be sure to understand these three. The product owner works with stakeholders, customers, and the teams to define the product direction. Typically, product owners have a business background and bring subject matter expertise of a deep nature to the decisions. Sometimes the product owner requests help from people with deep domain expertise, such as architects, or deep customer expertise, such as product managers. In Agile, product owners create the backlog for and with the team, and the backlog helps the team see how to deliver the highest value without creating waste and for that reason, 
I often refer to the product owner as a chief value officer. A critical success factor for agile teams is strong product ownership. Without attention to the highest value for the customer, the Agile team may create features that are not appreciated or otherwise insufficiently valuable, therefore wasting effort. So in your big run-up to your exam, you should recognize these roles talked about on pages 40 and 41 of the Agile Practice Guide. When it comes to planning and managing procurement, just remember high-level MSA, flexible arrangements, that's the way to go. Page 77 talks about a lot of these contracts. Remember in managing project artifacts, we have three artifacts in the world of Scrum. Product Backlog, Sprint Backlog, and PSI. But also remember that in a wider world of Agile, we might refer to other things as artifacts. Storyboards, burn up charts, burn down, charts, calves, and so on. It is important again to assess how to execute a project, which approaches to use methodology, methods, practices, should we go with an iterative, incremental, agile, or predictive approach, should we go with a hybridized approach. What does that look like on pages 27 and 28 in the Agile Practice Guide? Understand those models for hybridization. Understand that governance is not a bad word. It is the framework in which authority is exercised. Understand the importance of managing issues from a predictive standpoint, but when we talk about issues, a lot of times we're really using the word issue to replace impediment. As a good project manager, be proactive before a risk becomes an issue, you should have already thought about it. Make sure that you're transferring knowledge so the project can continue. In the world of Agile, this is done daily and continuously. Daily scrums, sprint reviews, backlog refinement, sprint retrospectives, sprint planning, these are all vehicles for sharing knowledge and ensuring project continuity. When you are closing out a project or phase in the world of predictive, it is different. In the world of Agile, we are ready to close at any time. In the sprint, remember what you are doing is iterative. You could be in a sprint and receive word it is the final sprint. You should be able to close out the sprint expediently without having to go five sprints back to look for lessons learned because those lessons learned are not documented from the world of Scrum in the world of Scrum. Her retrospective is where we hold those conversations sacred. They are not shared outside of the team. They are not documented outside of the team so that knowledge is with the team and that's why as much as possible we do not like change in team members. We want to keep the team as intact as possible so that those great behaviors that have been learned, overcoming the five stages of team development and getting to the performing stage is kept intact. When we talk about Agile from a business perspective, you want to think about compliance. Compliance should also be thought about even in Agile, and these are things that could make their way into the product backlog. When we talk about benefits and value from the world of Agile in business, value trumps everything else. The product owner arranges those backlog items based on to parameters, largely value and risk. High risk, high value do. Low risk, high value do next. Low value, low risk do. High risk, low value avoid. Make sense to not do. When it comes to evaluating the business environment from an agile perspective, this is something the product owner and the team should be involved in doing, but more so the product owner. The product owner should continually review the business environment for impacts on the project, the product backlog to be precise. 
When it comes to understanding how organizational change impacts the project and vice versa, all team members should have an awareness of this, but most importantly the servant leader should be well aware of how to support organizational change. And that is how you need to be thinking for your exam from an Agile perspective. Agile is huge on the exam. It has been said time and time again. What is my advice for you one day to the PMP exam? My advice is very simple. You must be calm, cool, action ready, a leader of yourself, and mindful. Let's expand on these just a little bit further. C is for cool, confident, collected amidst other things. Let me explain these in my mind when I say someone needs to be cool, I mean really relaxed. You need to be confident that you can do it, collected, composed, comfortable, and you need to cut off. There's no point studying up till midnight, and there is no point cramming. What you know, you know but it's more in the mindsets that I've talked about for the past 20 minutes that you need to focus on from an agile perspective and even those permeate into predictive as well. So be cool confident, collected, and composed. Know that you've got this. Cut off 7 p.m. the night before. Watch a movie, eat a nice meal, call it a day until your exam. Secondly, be aware and action ready. Things happen on the exam that will blow your mind. Students go into the exam thinking this is the day, I will finish with the PMP only to discover the computer had a different idea. Some folks go into the test centers only to discover the machines are not acting right. Some folks start off taking the exam when all of a sudden, there's a power cut. What are you gonna do? You need to be aware. You need to be action ready. And if anything happens that requires you to take your exam on a different day, just remember, be cool. You're six feet above the ground, you have every reason to be happy. The exam is not the end of the world and that needs to be your mindset because when these things happen, people often think it's the end of the world, but it's not. We need to remind ourselves to be aware, to be action ready, and to be cool. L. Lead yourself, less is more. To be a good leader of yourself, you need to understand your brain is not a machine. You are not a machine. Less is more, stop cramming, stop forcing information into your head that cannot go in at the last minute and have overarching thoughts instead. Instead of reading the entire Agile practice guide the night before, how about you listen to this video again and again? Instead of you reading the Pumbach guide over and over again, trying to cram 49 things that you should have. Understood not crammed, it's not the best way to go, so less is more one day to the exam. I would advise listening to this video over and over again and telling yourself you are a success, you are a champion, you are a victor in this battle towards this exam. That needs to be your mindset no matter what, no matter how you feel. When you're in the exam, I want you to remember I told you this, you need to be cool, calm, collected, aware, and a leader, and what does a leader do? A leader gives the people hope, lead yourself. Remember less is more. Last but not least, be mindful, mindful of your resources. Mindful that second-guessing yourself is a poor choice. Don't do it. And that is the overarching framework for thinking going into the exam. You gotta be calm. Remember my overarching mindsets. This is the project mnemonic. P be a problem solver. R respect authority. 
When you're answering questions on the exam, you need to be a problem solver, but you also need to respect authority. Do not go beyond your stated authority, respect authority, and don't disrespect authority. O is for own the problem, do not pass the blame. J is for just what is required, no gold plating. E equip the team, mentor, train, coach. There's an expectation that you do this. Escalate as appropriate. C changes are important, but review and check impact before doing. If a change has been approved, then it will be done, but when a change comes, you should always review it. Do an impact analysis. T the final one is take responsibility. Be accountable and show servant leader qualities. And that is the project acronym for your exam. It's all in the thinking. You must own the problem, you must move that situation forward. Saying no to someone is not the best answer because it doesn't move the situation forward so instead take responsibility, be a great leader. Let's talk about Agile Think one more time, people, communications, positivity, likability, not using punishment power, understanding the cross-functional team and the T-shaped and the paint drip and the broken comb. Working with the customer daily. Understanding change is not evil, it is good, and empowering the team. Now, we've talked quite a bit about the world of agile, we should talk about the world of predictive at a very high level. You will get questions of a predictive nature that may fall into the initiating process group. For this, you want to know your project charter components and your overall project risks. You also want to understand that the high-level requirements and overall project risks are indeed part of your project charter. You also want to remember that the preliminary scope comes before the project. In other words, your customer before signing the dotted line sends out an RFP that has some preliminary scope details that must come before the project. It is a strange term, but be aware that it does exist. Now, when you hear the term new project, sometimes that term new project could mean this is something we're thinking of doing. It does not immediately mean this is an authorization. When you hear the term new project, read between the lines and deduce if the project manager has already been assigned. If yes, that could mean there's already a charter in place, but if it says you are being looked at as someone who could manage this new project and that project has not been authorized and similar language. Be very comfortable when it comes to initiating, understanding that the project charter authorizes the project. Before the project charter is authorized, there are some pre-initiating events on page 30 in the Pumbak guide you got to understand the business case. Now the business case and the benefits management plan are important. Understand that an output of developed project charter is the assumptions log. The assumption log we use that for all manner of assumptions. Schedule assumptions such as lead time could be in there. Understand that facilitation is important, it's the name of the game in initiating. You even come across some conflict even way early and initiating. Understand that meeting management is important. Stakeholder identification could come in cycles before the project charter is authorized. And that's why one of the outputs within the project charter we call it a key stakeholder list. This is not a project charter, this is not a stakeholder register, it's a key stakeholder list. The stakeholder register should be updated so going into identifying stakeholders and initiating, just remember you have your project charter that goes in to identify stakeholders with the key stakeholder list. We build on that stakeholder list. 
That's how the stakeholder register is created. Going into planning, know your risk strategies. A team avoid, transfer, escalate, avoid, mitigate, avoid, transfer, escalate, accept, mitigate. The two ways avoid, accept. Understand your positive strategies so things such as the EASCE -E escalate, accept, share, exploit, enhance, EZ. Know those two. Know your early start and late start relationships and all of those dependencies. Understand that firm fixed price is favored a lot over time and materials when it comes to predictive projects. Your customer wants to know what they are likely to pay in total. When it comes to the aspect of executing, understand that interpersonal and soft skill use is better than relying on tools. Also, it is emphasized, questions will test your understanding of interpersonal and soft skills even from a predictive standpoint that is why a lot of people are tricked into thinking they are in agile questions because they are very interpersonal and soft skills heavy. Those are not agile questions, instead, you can think of those as hybrid questions. Monitoring and controlling Always follow recommended change control procedures. Understand you have no control over people's ability to request changes. Changes are not bad. Understand that variance analysis is used in monitoring and controlling. And when it comes to closing, page 123 in the PMBOK guide is important. Follow the recommended closure procedures, administrative closure, contract closure, closing out documents, releasing resources, releasing the team, understanding why a project was terminated, and things such as that are all important. Now, in closing, I want you to start getting into the zone of exam questions. What do I mean? I am talking about still with a calm mindset. Take a look at sample questions and be prepared to face questions like this that ask the question what should the project manager do next? What should the project manager do first? Without considering all the implications, your project sponsor requires that the project team be composed of resources located in three locations in three different time zones. This is expected to save cost and provide the optimal project team. Where should this be reflected in the project charter? Remember in the project charter. The answer given to this is A. Having a dispersed team does not come without risks. These risks need to be identified in the risk log for the project. Now, I am showing you this upfront so that you get into the mind zone for the exam. That zone of thinking for the exam should be one of fearlessness. Do not be scared of the questions you've seen, instead, let it warm you up to be in that zone the moment you get in. Let's take a look at yet another question. You are the project manager and your troubled project needs resource support from a supplier because several team members have been transferred to another project run by the CEO. Concerns arise about the cost risk of using a supplier at this stage of the project. You're working with the procurement team to establish specifications and the type of contract that should be used. What type of contract should you recommend? Now, the answer to this given by the question writer is D, a fixed price incentive fee contract fifth. The reason why I decided to show you questions of a slightly challenging nature is to build your courage to face the worst of questions. The good news, the questions on the exam will likely not be of this type. However, you should be prepared to face questions of a difficult nature should they show up as we have heard this from a number of people. Now that you've had a taste of predictive questions, 
why don't we take a look at questions of an agile nature, just a few to get you into that thinking zone. This reads the team is conducting a review meeting with a product owner and there are disagreements about whether the deliverables product increment for the iteration are acceptable, step was not adequately completed. So this is getting you into the zone, that's the purpose, to be in the zone with a language. The answer is not what I am after in this review, but it's warming you up to get into that mind zone for the exam. This question was written by a seasoned project manager. This project manager has been managing projects for over three decades and got certified over 25 years ago. The answer given to this is the definition of done was not addressed properly. Those are terms that you should be comfortable with. Here's another question, which of the following is not a hallmark of communications in Agile teams? The answer to this sticks out like a sore thumb because it is not mentioned anywhere in the Agile practice guide. The answer is a WAS or work authorization system. Be ready to face questions that you have never seen before on your exam when you find them, just remember they could be pre-test questions. Here's a final question, who is responsible for the high-level estimates of backlog items? The answer to this the team. I hope you enjoy this review. All the very best on your exam. Remember to be cool calm and collected remember not to sweat the small stuff just go 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 believe you've got this believe you can do this all the very best and bye for now agile mindset for your pmp exam we have students who are taking the exam and the question that i often get is what do i need to do when it is one two or three days to my pmp exam so today we're going to focus on agile deep thinking for your pmp exam in people process and business and i am gonna give you some one day to the pmp exam advice all rolled up in one this is actually a very condensed session I am going to squeeze 20 hours of learning into 20 minutes. So, let's first of all examine Agile Deep Thinking because I want you to get the low-hanging fruit for your exam. When I say think Agile, I mean espouse the manifesto details inside out. You need to be thinking about people first, communicating as often as possible, remember face-to-face -face is preferred, you also need to have a positive mental attitude. The questions will pose challenges in that you could choose a negative mindset, one of punishment power, or you could choose one of mentoring and coaching. If a team member is not performing up to par, what are you going to do? punish them or would you train and coach them? Would you help them to understand better ways of doing things? Be nice to people. Punishment is rarely a good cause of action. Sometimes that people need to be given a slap on the wrist for poor choices and bad behavior in an organization yes, but that is rarely PMI's focus on these questions. Cross-functional teams are important. It's important to see within each team people need to jump in to help each other. That is the entire idea when we talk about cross-functional teams. T-shaped scales, broken comb, paint drip. Those are words you should know. Work with the customer relentlessly, have a collaborative mindset as opposed to one of negotiation, understand that change is good. Kaizen change for the better. When your customer needs a change, give them the change to the extent possible. Empower the team. In order to think agile, you need to have a collaborative mindset when it comes to working with teams to manage conflict. When it comes to leading a team, think servant leadership, think situational leadership, 
Not a one-size-fits-all for everyone, but everyone on that team is a unique individual. If you are working with them, work with them with the Hersey Blanchard model at the back of your mind. As a leader in an organization, you should support the team's performance. Supporting their performance means you are helping them grow, you are helping them understand their performance and giving them feedback in a friendly non-threatening manner. The exam will test you on agile, think across people, process, and business. The understanding of building a team, equipping the team, appraising their skills is important. When it comes to the team being stuck, you should remember your definite for 15 unintelligible as a scrum master or servant leader is to continually reassess those impediments, obstacles, and blockers. Get them out of the way, prioritize them, big rocks first, smaller pebbles, sand next, but you want to attack those pesky impediments first. Negotiate all agreements, be it an agreement about velocity, schedule, cost even, what have you, but in the back of your mind, you need to read page 77 to understand an overarching master services agreement, smaller little agreements is helpful. Read that in the Agile Practice Guide have a mindset of collaboration, seeking to understand first before being understood, and that means using a method such as the DIGCIV approach to break down the problem. Define the problem, identify the root cause, generate alternatives, choose the best alternative, implement that alternative, and verify that it actually worked. As a servant leader, you must engage and support virtual teams. You should investigate the best way of engaging your team. Terms such as osmotic communication, information radiators, fishbowl window should come to mind. Understanding concepts for not only collaborating, but learning and mentoring are important. The concept of pair programming, understanding the team charter, Pages 49 and 50 in your Agile Practice Guide will go a long way to help you. Understanding the importance of mentoring, promoting team performance by using emotional intelligence. These will help you immensely on your exam. When it comes to the process piece from an Agile perspective, you need to also approach it from a softer side even though it's Agile let me explain what I mean. When you think about executing a project from an agile perspective, in the back of your mind, should be people, value, business value. In order to execute this project with a bunch of processes, I should be doing it to deliver value to my client and I should be thinking how can I deliver value in increments, not in one big clump, but in increment. When it comes to communications, your mindset, your thought process should be how can I get the communication as expediently as possible to those who need it, my team members, osmotic communication, information radiators, co-located team. When it comes to risk management in the world of Agile, this is something that is built into the process, multiple iterations. When it comes to engaging stakeholders, you must think first the primary reason I am doing this is success for my customer so when you engage stakeholders, you're doing it with a purpose to succeed with your customer. Your strategy for engagement is all about what works best for the customer. When it comes to planning and managing budget and resources, I would like you to pay close attention to page 92. In page 92 in the Agile Practice Guide, it reads projects with high degrees of uncertainty may not benefit from detailed cost calculations due to frequent changes, instead, weight estimation methods can be used to generate a fast high-level forecast. Your sprint is not going for years on end, at best for weeks. So, these short cycles provide rapid feedback on the approaches and suitability of deliverables and generally manifest as iterative scheduling and on-demand pull-based scheduling. 
Remember the importance of looking at poll-based systems instead of pushing work on people that is also something to think about. Think about flow-based Agile, Kanban, iteration-based Agile, the world of Scrum, and understand how scheduling could be done in iterations and in adjusting the time approach when it comes to flow-based. When it comes to quality, quality is built into the processes of Agile within a Scrum framework. The constant iterations enable check-in periodically, not just in sprint reviews, but you need to remember that sprint retrospectives are also a perfect way of self-inspection within the team that is also part of quality. So it's important to remember quality in Agile is built in. During retrospectives, the team regularly checks on the effectiveness of the quality process. They look at the root cause of issues then suggest trials of new approaches to improve quality. When it comes to scope management from an agile perspective, you should remember your product backlog can change according to EAF's enterprise environmental factors. Factors in the enterprise or factors that are in the marketplace could wildly affect your product backlog. Sometimes might negate so many of those stories in your backlog. When it comes to integration from an agile perspective, you should remember that the team is front and center, not the project manager, because there is no project manager theoretically in the world of Scrum. So, in the world of Scrum, using it as an example, integration is done by the team. Managing project changes is also important but remember, if you want to change anything within the sprint, it has to go through the product owner and changes during the sprint are forbidden, generally. Could they happen? They could but they must go through the product owner. Remember that changes to any part of the product backlog must be approved first of all by the product owner if it is going to be done. With that said, anyone can add to the product backlog. But once the product backlog has been prioritized, once you get an idea of what to be done in the next sprint, those ideas should be held in place as much as possible and any changes must go through the product owner. It is a very powerful role. It is a role that should be respected. And if there's no respect for the product owner, there could be problems. You could get questions that really test your understanding of these roles. I want to encourage you, if you have not already done so, do read page 40. Page 41 in your Agile Practice Guide page 40 starts off with Agile roles. In Agile, three common roles are used. It reads cross-functional team members, product owner, and team facilitator. Be sure to understand these three. The product owner works with stakeholders, customers, and the teams to define the product direction. Typically, product owners have a business background and bring subject matter expertise of a deep nature to the decisions. Sometimes the product owner requests help from people with deep domain expertise, such as architects, or deep customer expertise, such as product managers. In Agile, product owners create the backlog for and with the team, and the backlog helps the team see how to deliver the highest value without creating waste and for that reason, I often refer to the product owner as a chief value officer. A critical success factor for Agile teams is strong product ownership. Without attention to the highest value for the customer, the Agile team may create features that are not appreciated or otherwise insufficiently valuable, therefore wasting effort. So in your big run up to your exam, you should recognize these roles talked about on pages 40 and 41 of the Agile Practice Guide. When it comes to planning and managing procurement, just remember high-level MSA, flexible arrangements, that's the way to go. 
Page 77 talks about a lot of these contracts. Remember in managing project artifacts, we have three artifacts in the world of Scrum. Product Backlog, Sprint Backlog, and PSI. But also remember that in a wider world of Agile, we might refer to other things as artifacts. Storyboards, burn up charts, burn down, charts, calves, and so on. It is important again to assess how to execute a project, which approaches to use methodology, methods, practices, should we go with an iterative, incremental, agile, or predictive approach, should we go with a hybridized approach. What does that look like on pages 27 and 28 in the Agile Practice Guide? Understand those models for hybridization. Understand that governance is not a bad word. It is the framework in which authority is exercised. Understand the importance of managing issues from a predictive standpoint, but when we talk about issues, a lot of times we're really using the word issue to replace impediment. As a good project manager, be proactive before a risk becomes an issue, you should have already thought about it. Make sure that you're transferring knowledge so the project can continue. In the world of Agile, this is done daily and continuously. Daily scrums, sprint reviews, backlog refinement, sprint retrospectives, sprint planning, these are all vehicles for sharing knowledge and ensuring project continuity. When you are closing out a project or phase in the world of predictive, it is different. In the world of Agile, we are ready to close at any time. In the sprint, remember what you are doing is iterative. You could be in a sprint and receive word it is the final sprint. You should be able to close out the sprint expediently without having to go five sprints back to look for lessons learned because those lessons learned are not documented from the world of Scrum in the world of Scrum. Her retrospective is where we hold those conversations sacred. They are not shared outside of the team. They are not documented outside of the team so that knowledge is with the team and that's why as much as possible we do not like change in team members. We want to keep the team as intact as possible so that those great behaviors that have been learned, overcoming the five stages of team development and getting to the performing stage is kept intact. When we talk about Agile from a business perspective, you want to think about compliance. Compliance should also be thought about even in Agile, and these are things that could make their way into the product backlog. When we talk about benefits and value from the world of Agile in business, value trumps everything else. The product owner arranges those backlog items based on two parameters, largely value and risk. High risk, high value do. Low risk, high value do next. Low value, low risk do. High risk, low value avoid. Makes sense to not do. When it comes to evaluating the business environment from an agile perspective, this is something the product owner and the team should be involved in doing, but more so the product owner. The product owner should continually review the business environment for impacts on the project, the product backlog to be precise. When it comes to understanding how organizational change impacts the project and vice versa, all team members should have an awareness of this, but most importantly the servant leader should be well aware of how to support organizational change. And that is how you need to be thinking for your exam from an Agile perspective. Agile is huge on the exam. It has been said time and time again. What is my advice for you one day to the PMP exam? My advice is very simple. You must be calm, cool, action-ready, a leader of yourself, and mindful. 
Let's expand on these just a little bit further. C is for cool, confident, collected amidst other things. Let me explain these in my mind when I say someone needs to be cool, I mean really relaxed. You need to be confident that you can do it, collected, composed, comfortable, and you need to cut off. There's no point studying up till midnight, and there is no point cramming. What you know, you know but it's more in the mindsets that I've talked about for the past 20 minutes that you need to focus on from an agile perspective and even those permeate into predictive as well. So be cool confident, collected, and composed. Know that you've got this. Cut off 7 p.m. the night before. Watch a movie, eat a nice meal, call it a day until your exam. Secondly, be aware and action ready. Things happen on the exam that will blow your mind. Students go into the exam thinking this is the day, I will finish with the PMP only to discover the computer had a different idea. Some folks go into the test centers only to discover the machines are not acting right. Some folks start off taking the exam when all of a sudden, there's a power cut. What are you gonna do? You need to be aware. You need to be action ready. And if anything happens that requires you to take your exam on a different day, just remember, be cool. You're six feet above the ground, you have every reason to be happy. The exam is not the end of the world and that needs to be your mindset because when these things happen, people often think it's the end of the world but it's not. We need to remind ourselves to be aware, to be action ready, and to be cool. L. Lead yourself, less is more. To be a good leader of yourself, you need to understand your brain is not a machine. You are not a machine. Less is more, stop cramming, stop forcing information into your head that cannot go in at the last minute and have overarching thoughts instead. Instead of reading the entire Agile practice guide the night before, how about you listen to this video again and again? Instead of you reading the Pumbach guide over and over again, trying to cram 49 things that you should have. Understood not crammed, it's not the best way to go, so less is more one day to the exam. I would advise listening to this video over and over again and telling yourself you are a success, you are a champion, you are a victor in this battle towards this exam. That needs to be your mindset no matter what, no matter how you feel. When you're in the exam, I want you to remember I told you this, you need to be cool, calm, collected, aware, and a leader, and what does a leader do? A leader gives the people hope, lead yourself. Remember less is more. Last but not least, be mindful, mindful of your resources. Mindful that second-guessing yourself is a poor choice. Don't do it. And that is the overarching framework for thinking going into the exam. I am talking about still with a calm mindset, take a look at sample questions, and be prepared to face questions like this that ask the question, what should the project manager do next? What should the project manager do first? Without considering all the implications, your project sponsor requires that the project team be composed of resources located in three locations in three different time zones. This is expected to save cost and provide the optimal project team. Where should this be reflected in the project charter? Remember in the project charter. The answer given to this is A. Having a dispersed team does not come without risks. These risks need to be identified in the risk log for the project. Now, I am showing you this upfront so that you get into the mind zone for the exam. 
That zone of thinking for the exam should be one of fearlessness. Do not be scared of the questions you've seen, instead, let it warm you up to be in that zone the moment you get in. Let's take a look at yet another question. You are the project manager and your troubled project needs resource support from a supplier because several team members have been transferred to another project run by the CEO. Concerns arise about the cost risk of using a supplier at this stage of the project. You're working with the procurement team to establish specifications and the type of contract that should be used. What type of contract should you recommend? Now, the answer to this given by the question writer is D, a fixed price incentive fee contract fifth. The reason why I decided to show you questions of a slightly challenging nature is to build your courage to face the worst of questions. The good news, the questions on the exam will likely not be of this type. However, you should be prepared to face questions of a difficult nature should they show up, as we have PMP exam mindset mantras. This encapsulates the way you need to think as a PMP, someone who is expected to be a leader, expected to be a decision maker, and one who understands the tools of the trade for project management. These 36 mantras will help you on your PMP exam to effectively think through the problems. Let's take a look at them one by one. The very first one is about people. This is a collection of 12 statements that fine tune your focus where people are concerned. Be familiar with terms such as team, customer, product owner, sponsor, stakeholder, program manager, portfolio manager, steering committee, functional heads. The first part of the mantra is about the customer. Make your customer's success a primary goal. Advancement, work with a customer to move the project forward. Do not choose options that kick the can down the road. In other words, do not choose options that pass the buck to someone else. Your mindset needs to be passing the buck stops here. Fairness, treat others fairly and have empathy and be mindful and aware of diversity and inclusion. And be aware that inclusion has more to do with race, religion, and orientation. Inclusion is all about bringing people in so that they feel part of the team. Steward, protect resources entrusted to you. Treat those resources with care. Be a fiduciary of those resources. Team, focus on stakeholder and team health, well-being and synergy. Remember, give the team the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Team trust, trust the team, trust their judgment, allow them choose their way of working. If you get questions on the exam that give you an option of going against what the team thinks is the best option, don't choose that. No matter how appetizing it looks, let the team make their mind up for themselves, especially in an agile environment. Servant leader, defend the team, be a diversion shield and facilitate conflict resolution. Mentor, mentor, coach, serve and guide the team instead of using punishment and coercion. Do not fire the team members, but instead mentor and coach them to excellence. Integrity, do not abuse your position or title or be partial in your actions. One way we could be partial in our actions is favoring team members. On agile questions, remember that the best option for reward is rewarding the entire team, not just a few people on the team who, in quote, perform better. Honesty, be honest and truthful in all your dealings even if it may offend others. Leadership, be courageous to lead, make tough decisions and tough conversations and make trade-offs. If you have not paid close attention to pages 33 
to 37 in the Agile Practice Guide, I would recommend that you do. Finally, in people, agility, be agile and adapt to be resilient. Let's move into process. Here we have knowledge areas, process groups, processes, formulas, methods, models, artifacts, theory, framework, and practices. You should be familiar with this lingo. Very first in process is all about the life cycle. Select and tailor the appropriate project life cycle and development approach. What do you do when you need frequent delivery but low degree of change? Or frequent delivery and high degree of change? Well, that's agile. Frequent delivery and low degree of change is incremental. How do you know these? Open up your Agile Practice Guide and focus on pages 18 and 19. This will help you better understand the four life cycle types talked about. Incremental, iterative, predictive, and agile. And don't forget, a hybrid life cycle is also an option. Hybridize where necessary to maximize value and options. Have an agile mindset. Seek to deliver incrementally. Plan iteratively where possible. Be systematic and strategic. Think systematically and strategically to navigate complexity. In other words, think about the big picture and how the pieces interconnect. Change, manage change and configuration with intentionality. Change management usually deals with change requests. Configuration management may not necessarily deal with change requests to that level of detail, but an overarching understanding of what configurable items are on the project. The configurable items should have already been identified. And once those have been identified, our focus is on version control and upholding the systems that we have put in place to do so. Inspect and adapt. Continuously inspect and adapt and integrate all levels and layers. Problem solve is probably one that summarizes your entire exam. If you are not solving the problem, you are not answering the question properly. Solving the problem means not passing the buck and not saying no, but looking for a solution that moves the problem forward, that moves whatever circumstance it is, an issue, an impediment forward. So be a problem solver and offer solutions, not problems. Quality or the iron triangle. Proactively build in quality and manage the iron triangle. Schedule, cost, and scope. Have you ever heard of the iron triangle, schedule, cost, and scope? If you haven't, let's take a very quick look at it. The iron triangle sees schedule, cost, and scope. And an adjustment in any of those sides under most circumstances will necessitate some change on the other sides. So imagine quality being in the middle. Well, quality is impacted by scope and schedule and cost. If you want to increase scope, there could be a change to the schedule side and also the cost side. So this sensitizes you to always look 360 at what a change will do to any of these schedule, cost, scope, quality as well. But we don't stop there. Some people talk about a quadruple constraint and they talk about schedule, cost, scope, resources, and they put quality in the middle. And we could go on and on to a quintuple constraint and so on. But the bottom line is this, whenever you get a change request, make sure that you analyze and assess it from all perspectives. Risk and governance, proactively manage risk and governance, manage all areas. In other words, logically plan and manage all knowledge areas, 
buy-in and authorization is important, so seek it where necessary. And in closing, the closing process group, we close each stage, each iteration or phase with a retrospective or lessons learned. The bottom line is that process could get rather technical. So let's back up for a quick second and talk about how you need to be thinking in process. When you approach process questions, you need to remember that as you develop the project charter, this is the first step on any project. It is mandatory. It is one of those mantras that says, no charter, no project. No charter, you're not authorized. When you have your charter, the next thing that should happen is the planning activities. Now, of course, the planning activities are multiple planning activities. In fact, in the sixth edition of the PMBOK guide, you find 24 planning processes. Now, while the project charter is being developed, bear in mind you also have other things that come out of this process, such as an assumption log. These are things to be aware of. At the same time, in initiating, we could very well be thinking about the identification of stakeholders. This does not have to be in strict cookie cutter rotation. The logic is the moment the charter is developed, stuff can begin to happen. Stakeholders are continuously identified all throughout the project. Stakeholders are very important input to the topic of quality and the topic of risk because quality and risk could be rather perceptual. So we wanna invite our stakeholders into those conversations as early as possible. Before that, we would also invite our stakeholders into the topic of the collection of requirements. So understanding how these parts are interwoven is pivotal for your success in the process area. The summary is we have our charter, we have a plan and we begin to execute the work. And as we're executing the work, we're at the same time monitoring and controlling the work. And there's a feedback loop and it goes on and on until we get our desired output, which is an accepted deliverable. And that goes to the closing of the project. And then we have a transition to the customer. But bear in mind that executing is going to give you a deliverable that we will then inspect and it becomes a validated deliverable before we ultimately will get an accepted deliverable. Again, understanding how these parts are interwoven is pivotal for your success on the PMP exam process piece. Let's talk about the final piece here. It's the business piece. And this looks at outcomes, value, benefits, revenue, advantage, demand, cost of delay, revenue leakage, opportunity erosion, competition, compliance, organizational change, strategy, and business. These are all terms you could hear in this domain. The very first mantra is environment. You gotta observe and respond to the external and internal environment. If you are a product owner, then you obviously need to be aware of the environment. Outcomes, focus on outcomes, value and benefits over output. By output, we could be referring to a deliverable. The outcome of the project is more important than the deliverable. The deliverable is a stepping stone towards the outcome, but it is not the outcome. The major outcome you're looking for is what happens after that deliverable is implemented and used. We get value, benefits are realized, and then the outcome. So what is value? It's the net quantifiable benefits that we derive from using whatever the project is meant to produce. And if we are realizing benefits, it will lead us to our desired outcome.
organizational change, set the stage for organizational change and build alliances. Stakeholder engagement is what this refers to. Project impact, assess the project's impact on the organization and navigate accordingly. Be aware of political landmines. Organization impact, assess the organization's impact on the project and navigate accordingly. So how does the organization affect the project? How does the project affect the organization? Next, we have benefits. Proactively ensure management of benefits and their realization. If you have not paid close attention to pages 33 and 7 in the PMBOK Guide 6th edition, I highly urge you to. Value swap. Think about this as the dynamic scope option talked about around page 78. Swap out backlog items with work of comparable value. Now, when I say page 78, I mean the Agile Practice Guide, page 78. This is where you have different Agile contracts talked about. In fact, make a note to self, page 77 and 78 should be read. Value delivery. Strategically plan the value delivery system. The value delivery system is talked about at length in the PMBOK Guide 7th edition, but what it really means in a nutshell is the integration of projects, programs, and portfolios, along with the operational work to deliver value. Whatever value is, it's perceptual, but the project, program, portfolio, operation system enables you to deliver and realize that value. And that's what the value delivery system is. It has to be strategically planned, not just winging it, but actually deciding how to structure work. Remember, portfolio management is doing the right work. Project management is about doing the work right. Compliance, proactively manage compliance. You could be out of compliance and face stiff penalties. You do not want that. Sustainable community, harness communities of practice, PMOs, project management offices, VDOs, value delivery offices used a lot in Agile these days for the team's strategic goals. Lean thinking, think and be lean to eliminate waste at all levels of the value delivery system. And lastly, gating, use toll gates, stage gates, kill points, and phase end reviews to deliver only value. If you are looking for help towards your exam, my friends, go on down to praiseon.com. We have different programs in Agile, in the predictive world, for the CAPM, for the PMP, and Scrum in general. Again, P-R-A-I-Z-I-O-N.com. Thank you very much for joining me. I wish you all the very best in all your endeavors and on the PMP exam. PMP exam mindset mantras. This encapsulates the way you need to think as a PMP, someone who is expected to be a leader, expected to be a decision maker, and one who understands the tools of the trade for project management. These 36 mantras will help you on your PMP exam to effectively think through the problems. Let's take a look at them one by one. The very first one is about people. This is a collection of 12 statements that fine tune your focus where people are concerned. Be familiar with terms such as team, customer, product owner, sponsor, stakeholder, program manager, portfolio manager, steering committee, functional heads. The first part of the mantra is about the customer. Make your customer's success a primary goal. Advancement, work with a customer to move the project forward. Do not choose options that kick the can down the road. In other words, do not choose options that pass the buck to someone else. Your mindset needs to be passing the buck stops here. Fairness, treat others fairly 
and have empathy and be mindful and aware of diversity and inclusion. And be aware that inclusion has more to do with race, religion, and orientation. Inclusion is all about bringing people in so that they feel part of the team. Steward, protect resources entrusted to you. Treat those resources with care. Be a fiduciary of those resources. Team, focus on stakeholder and team health, well-being, and synergy. Remember, give the team the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Team trust. Trust the team. Trust their judgment. Allow them choose their way of working. If you get questions on the exam that give you an option of going against what the team thinks is the best option, don't choose that. No matter how appetizing it looks, let the team make their mind up for themselves, especially in an agile environment. Servant leader, defend the team, be a diversion shield and facilitate conflict resolution. Mentor, mentor, coach, serve and guide the team instead of using punishment and coercion. Do not fire the team members, but instead mentor and coach them to excellence. Integrity, do not abuse your position or title or be partial in your actions. One way we could be partial in our actions is favoring team members. On agile questions, remember that the best option for reward is rewarding the entire team, not just a few people on the team who, in quote, perform better. Honesty, be honest and truthful in all your dealings even if it may offend others. Leadership, be courageous to lead, make tough decisions and tough conversations and make trade-offs. If you have not paid close attention to pages 33 to 37 in the Agile Practice Guide, I would recommend that you do. Finally, in people, agility, be agile and adapt to be resilient. Let's move into process. Here we have knowledge areas, process groups, processes, formulas, methods, models, artifacts, theory, framework, and practices. You should be familiar with this lingo. Very first in process is all about the life cycle. Select and tailor the appropriate project life cycle and development approach. What do you do when you need frequent delivery but low degree of change? Or frequent delivery and high degree of change? Well, that's agile. Frequent delivery and low degree of change is incremental. How do you know these? Open up your Agile Practice Guide and focus on pages 18 and 19. This will help you better understand the four life cycle types talked about. Incremental, iterative, predictive, and agile. And don't forget, a hybrid life cycle is also an option. Hybridize where necessary to maximize value and options. Have an agile mindset. Seek to deliver incrementally. Plan iteratively where possible. Be systematic and strategic. Think systematically and strategically to navigate complexity. In other words, think about the big picture and how the pieces interconnect. Change. Manage change and configuration with intentionality. Change management usually deals with change requests. Configuration management may not necessarily deal with change requests to that level of detail, but an overarching understanding of what configurable items are on the project. The configurable items should have already been identified. And once those have been identified, our focus is on version control and upholding the systems that we have put in place to do so. Inspect and adapt. Continuously inspect and adapt and integrate all levels and layers. Problem solve is probably one that summarizes your entire exam. If you are not solving the problem, you are not answering the question properly. Solving the problem means not passing the buck and not saying no. 
Hello, my friends, your buddy Phil here, project management trainer and coach. I hope you're doing well. Today, we're going to be talking about the PMP exam and taking a look at the most important things. Now, breaking news for the past number of years, I've always told you, read the sixth edition, right? Know your ITTOs, know the process groups, stuff like that. Well, here's the deal. The reason why you need to do that is not really because of the exam. It is for your professional life as a project manager to enable you feel comfortable. Personally, I studied the PMBOK guide second edition twice. I went over it. That's what my exam was based on. And I read it twice. And I ended up reading the third edition as well in error about halfway. So I had read the PMBOK guide backwards and forwards, and that is what helped me on the exam to be able to cope with the language. Because when they write questions, they're gonna bake in predictive language, agile language, hybrid language. So for the longest time, I have said, read the book. Now, in 2022, I have to be honest, I've heard a smattering of things from students, but I know you shouldn't focus your energies on memorizing, on cramming. It's not going to help you. What is going to help you is understanding the logic, understanding the general framework, and understanding the flow of stuff. Let me try my best in the next 30 minutes to summarize this for you such that if this was your final study day, the information I'm sharing with you here today will see you through. In fact, this video is for people who have got the exam coming up real quick and they're panicking and they're freaking out. This video is to calm your mind and to gently work in the logic, the logic that is in the sixth, the logic that is in the seventh, if you wanted to call it that, and the values and principles talked about on page eight and nine. So what I'm doing here is taking these three books and I am condensing them for you. Now, I have already done that in a book that is going to be released to the public very soon. Right now, it's only available to my students and it's called Project Management Layman's Guide. I have condensed tons and tons of pages into a very small book with 50 solid questions to get you into that mindset for the exam. So right now we're gonna cover the PMP exam mindset mantra. We're gonna spend some time getting into the mindset. Let's get started. I have broken this down into people. Let's talk about the people mindset. For the exam, you gotta be familiar and ready to see words such as team, customer, stakeholder, sponsor, product owner, program manager, and so on. The first thing you want to be thinking about is the customer. Be obsessed with the customer. Make your customer success a primary goal. Always look out for the customer. Next, focus on the team. Focus on the stakeholder and their well-being and their health and their synergy. Integrity. Do not abuse your position or title or be partial in your actions. Make sure you choose those options where you are always taking the higher ground, where you are above board and everything you are doing is on point. Advancement, always move the project forward. I cannot overstate this. This is by far one of the most important points for your exam. Always choose the option that moves the project forward. Let me give you an example. You get a question that says, you're a project manager that has a stakeholder that has refused to sign documentation. What should you do? And you've got A, report that stakeholder to their boss. What good does that do in the grand scheme? Then you have B, discuss with the stakeholder and understand their point of view. That is the better option. So any option that does not move the problem or the issue forward or advance the project, do not choose. Always choose the best option to advance the project. Team trust. Trust the team and their judgment. The questions will test you on understanding that the team should be 
self-organizing, autonomous, and you should believe the best in the team. Allow the team to choose their own way of working. Honesty. Be honest and truthful in all your dealings, even if it may offend others. Even if it seems like someone's going to be mad in the question, still go ahead, do it anyway. Fairness. Treat others fairly. Have empathy. Be mindful and aware of diversity and inclusion. So assume you're a project manager on a project and there's a team member that has been ostracized in some way by the other team members. What should you do? Should you just allow that team member to be all on their own? You find out that they're not including this person in discussions, in debate. You're realizing that the person is always isolated and they're not including the person in group activities. What should you do as a scrum master, as a servant leader, as a project manager? Remember, you are a coach, a mentor. So you need to mentor and coach these individuals into inclusion and diversity. That is what you as a leader needs to be thinking about. Treat others fairly, have empathy, be mindful and aware of diversity and also that everyone is included. Next, servant leader, defend the team, be a diversion shield and facilitate conflict resolution. So what we're talking about here is to protect the team, to act in a capacity of diverting anything coming at the team from a distracting point of view. People wanted to throw more work on the team that has nothing to do with the ongoing project or ongoing endeavor you should act as a diversion shield. You should also act as a shield to remove impediments, obstacles, blockers. You should use your network as a project manager or as a servant leader to find ways of removing any blockers around. And what we've heard from a lot of students who take the exam is that the word servant leader may not be used as much but you can tell it is a servant leader being discussed. You can also tell that the word scrum master may not show up as much, but you know this is talking about a servant leader figure. So get comfortable with the idea that they could still come at you from the angle of project manager, but you need to be thinking servant leader. Leadership, be courageous to lead, make tough decisions, have tough conversations, make trade-offs. It will amaze you that some of the questions may push you to the limit where the best option may be to let someone go from a project. You gotta be bold to make those decisions. Other instances, it would not be fair to let that person go because that person is a capable individual, would be a good one to have on the team, but you need to know when to use mentoring and coaching and training. But there are going to be some decisions where you need to make the tough decisions. It will push you to that limit, that place you don't want to go, that place you don't want to address. It will be in your face. Trust me, it's happened to me on the exam. I have seen questions come at me right there in my face. And you need to decide, make the tough decisions. Be a steward, protect resources entrusted to you and treat them with care. Remember, you are a fiduciary of these resources. So treat team members with care, treat physical resources with care, ensure that they are well taken care of and allocated as they are supposed to be. Do not abuse the resources that are in your care. Next, be a mentor. Mentor, coach, serve, and guide the team instead of using punishment and coercion. Your go-to response needs to be one of mentoring and coaching in order to get the team on the same page, to introduce the behaviors you desire, and things like that. Next one is agility. Be agile and adapt to be resilient. That is the final one in the people domain. And when we talk about agile, what are we saying? Adapt, be resilient. Even if you are in a hybrid situation, your thinking should be agile, not predictive, right? Because agile means you could be more iterative or incremental or less. So agility is always the best way. Being predictive is just a one-way street. You got to remember that. 
the agile person could always change. The predictive person will be sticking to their guns. You've got to remember that. Let's go into the next one, the second one. This is a process mantra. So when you're in the exam, you're going to face knowledge areas, process groups, processes, formulas, methods, models, artifacts, theory, frameworks, and practices. And it's for this reason, this reason that I tell people know a little bit, okay? Now, for those of you who have your exam coming up in the next week, let me give you some solid advice. Please do this. Open up your sixth edition. Don't go to the main body because it's already too late at this point. What I want you to do, first of all, look for all of my videos on YouTube where I have the one minute summaries. So I have a one minute summary for all of the knowledge areas. And I have a summary about five minutes or so for chapters one, two, and three. That's all you need at this point, because forget it. If your exam is next week, spend some time doing other things, not reading this whole book, okay? If you're good at speed reading, I want to give you a cadence here. I want you to spend on every chapter, not more than 10 minutes to go through it. I'm not talking about skimming through, but I'm talking about speed power reading through. And if you want to know a little bit more about how to do this, there's some courses online where you can quickly learn tips and tricks to help you speed read. One of such individuals is Jimmy Quick. Check out his information. He specializes in a lot of brain optimization stuff. Check out Jimmy K-W-I-K. You'll find him on YouTube. And he talks about how you can speed read. And just listen to what he has to say and apply it. But I would say the cadence is roughly 10 minutes per chapter. Don't spend any more than that. And you'll be amazed after listening to Jimmy and applying that stuff to the book, what you're going to gain. All right. Now, when you have done that, if you can even do that for two, it'll take you about two hours. So if you spend 10 minutes on each one, 10 times uh, 40, 13 chapters, that's 120. That's roughly two hours plus. Don't spend more than that because it's just going to be law of diminishing returns. You're going to get all bothered about ITTOs that you're not able to memorize. Don't memorize them. Understand. As you're going through, just say, do I understand it? Let, let me give you an example. Quick example. So I randomly open the book to page 434. And I see a diamond and it says sensitivity analysis. I need to know what this is at a high level. That's enough. OK, for most of these, I want to say about 95 percent of the stuff here, if you understand it at a decent level, high level, that's enough. You don't need to go cram in every single ITTO where it comes from. No, but you don't have to, because let me tell you why. I do a lot of listening to students who take the exam, my students other students. And you know what I've heard in 2021? It was a broken record. I kept hearing the PEMBOK guide and all the processes, process groups, knowledge areas, they were not verbatim on the exam. So cramming is not going to help you. A lot of people say not even a single ITTO spelt as it is in the guide appeared on the exam. You understand what I'm saying? So be smart. Go through the content. As I'm looking at sensitivity analysis here, I need to get the overall gist. Sensitivity analysis helps to determine which individual project risks or other sources of uncertainty have the most potential impact on project outcomes. Boom, it's not rocket science. I don't need to go off on a rabbit trail fretting about the image under it. <laughs> the image under it is the tornado diagram. Let me let me tell you the logic. Here's my logic before you know the, the, the PEMBOK six Puritans come at me. No one is more passionate about the six than I am. But something else I'm passionate about is use of time, good use of time, and being lean and mean with your time. Don't waste time because no one's got time to waste. I don't. I hate people wasting my time, and I want to spend yours wisely with you. So spend two hours if you've got it. On this book, I would say spend one hour speed reading again through it. This book, I would say, do read this in detail. Now, when it comes to the seventh edition and the sixth edition, one more thing I want you to do with 30 minutes, and I've done this on this channel over and over again. I go through glossary items. 
I want you to spend 30 minutes going through the glossary in this book, going through nothing but the glossary, just looking for terms that you don't know. And finally, this one, just looking for terms. So if you spend, if your exam is in a week, spend a day doing what I've told you to do here. And that's enough. Okay. The process piece, the language may be more technical, or I should say more process oriented, more towards the spectrum of frameworks. That's okay. If you do what I've asked you to do with those books, you're going to be good. Okay. So let's talk about process now. All right. So the process mantra, like I said, knowledge areas, process groups, that whole talk about cost, scope, schedule, risk, procurement, stakeholders, all that stuff, you're going to find language like this. First mantra, life cycle, life cycle, select and tailor, life cycle, the appropriate project life cycle, tailor the life cycle, tailor the development approach, understand the project life cycle is a collection of phases and those phases are peculiar to the technical work being done, but most importantly, the development approach must also be appropriate, iterative, incremental, predictive, agile, choose the right development approach. What if I have a simple project? What if I have chaos? What if I have anarchy? Which one do I choose? If I have anarchy, I'm going to be on the side of agile. If I've got very predictive, simple, I'm going to be in predictive space. If I've got a high degree of change and a high degree of delivery, delivering frequently and rapidly, I'm going to be agile. But if I've got a high frequency of delivery and a low degree of change, I'm going to be incremental. If I've got a low degree of change and a low degree of delivery, I'm going to be predictive. If I've got a low degree of delivery or low frequency of delivery and a high degree of change, I'm going to be iterative. So you've got to know page 18 and 19 in the Agile Practice Guide. Change. Manage change and configuration with intentionality. Understand change is all about changes on the project and documents on the project. When we talk about configuration, we're specifically talking about artifacts and deliverables and version control of things like drawings and widgets and overall deliverable items. Risk and governance, proactively manage risk and governance. You got to remember governance is the framework within which authority is exercised. The span and type of governance in every situation differs from project to project and opportunity to opportunity, but you need to understand and be comfortable with what governance is, the language around governance, and also risk management. How do you proactively manage risk instead of being reactive? Proactive risk management means planning how to manage risks, identifying the risks, performing the right analyses, be they qualitative or quantitative, and then planning the risk response. Also, implementing the response is proactive, doing it at the right time, using your influence as a project manager to make things happen, and ultimately monitoring risk. All that dialogue is helpful. For this reason, you do need to know, at a minimum, every process group, what you do there, every knowledge area, what you do there, and each one of the 49 processes. you got to know what you're doing. That is non-negotiable. Hybridize. Hybridize where necessary to maximize value and options. Why would you hybridize? Because there's always an opportunity to be iterative or incremental. And that is what hybridization is all about. The right titration for increments and to plan in iterations. That's what it's all about. So hybridize where necessary. If there's an opportunity to hybridize, instead of being just predictive, then hybridize. Inspect and adapt. It's one of the tenets of Agile. We continuously inspect, adapt, and integrate on all levels. Scrum pillars, transparency, inspection, adaptation, very important. In our daily Scrum, we are actually inspecting the work we are actually adapting as well. 
a lot of great things get discovered in a daily scrum. So unlike folks who think of a lessons learned only, you want to think about a retrospective where you can honestly and openly inspect and adapt, be transparent. You got to understand for your exam, things such as a retrospective may not be explicitly called that, but the idea of what you're doing in the retrospective in the daily scrum is important. Manage all areas. This summary simply states, logically plan and manage all knowledge areas. And we're talking about integration all the way on down to stakeholder. You should, hey, hey, you should. I know for the longest time I have said, don't go crazy on the book. But just because I said, don't go crazy on the book doesn't mean that you're gonna go into the exam a week and you, you can't explain integration or scope or cost. You can't explain any of the knowledge areas. That's a problem, my friends. So even if you end up saying, Phil, I can't read this book, it's so big. Look for my one minute summaries on YouTube, watch them. There's no excuse. Look, I've put out over 2000 videos for you. There's no excuse. If you do a search, crazy on risk, you'll come up with a plethora of videos. I've lost track of them, but they're all out there for you. Tap into it. Just look for the videos and watch. You need to know the 10 knowledge areas, what they are, the five process groups, the story about them, and the 49 processes. And yes, I know it's not in the seventh explicitly, but PM I have that in the background in Standards Plus, which is linked to the seventh. So anyone telling you you don't need to know some technicalities, they're lying. And it's risky because people are still failing the PMP. We're not hearing about a lot of them, but people are still failing in some numbers. So you gotta be smart. You know, exam retake fees is usually a lot of these organizations bread and butter. I don't think they're gonna forego that. So you don't wanna be one of the victims that pays the <laughs> re-examination fee. That's all I'm saying. Better your chances of success by really knowing what every knowledge area process group and process is enough said let's move on manage all areas understand all the areas all the knowledge areas and how to effectively manage them i said it again agile that agile mindset seek to deliver incrementally plan iteratively where possible break the work into chunks break delivery into chunks break planning into chunks what does it do it's a risk coping mechanism when you deliver in increments you are narrowing down any issues that could potentially happen per increment not per release but per increment it helps you as a risk coping mechanism this is by far one of the most important ones in the whole deck it's problem solve be a problem solver, solve the real problem. Don't ask mother, may I, sponsor, may I, don't do that. Put on your thinking hat, solve the problem. Offer solutions, not problems. You go in to ask questions in many an instance is the bad thing to do. The best thing to do is to solve the problem with a team and get stuff moving, move the project forward. The next one is buy-in slash authorization. Seek authorization and buy-in when necessary. There are going to be times to bring in the team, bring in the stakeholders to get authorization. That's really what this is talking about, your project charter and trade-offs. There are times when you're going to have to trade off, and when you're trading off, you need to get buy-in. This is a very important one as well, systematic and strategic thinking. Think systematically and strategically to navigate complexity. You got to ask the question, what does the company want? What does the company need? What is the whole picture? What is going on right now? So when they give you a question on the exam, you got to understand the question. You got to read the question to understand what is happening. And you need to be able to see how everything is interwoven, how everything joins, and you got to weave the story together really quickly in under a minute. 
you got to get the gist of the story and you got to be able to navigate that complexity that you're being given because that's what the exam is about complexity problem solving being strategic what is the best strategic position based on this question next is the iron triangle and quality proactively building quality and manage the iron triangle what are we saying here remember in the agile manifesto we talk about technical excellence and good design enhances your agility well technical excellence is part of quality managing the iron triangle is when you understand the importance of schedule cost and scope in the world of agile when we talk about the iron triangle you got to remember that it's flipped on its head and instead of you having scope fixed like we do in traditional we have flexible scope but we have a fixed schedule and budget your sprint is a fixed time box where you get stuff done that fits into it your budget is fixed by virtue of a team that is pretty much fixed within certain bounds we don't want to introduce team members in ad nauseum instead we want to make sure when we introduce team members it's because we absolutely have to and we don't want to go over the number of three to nine and we're not doing this to increase our velocity we're not doing this to get more and more done uh, in a non-agile way we always want to remember the five stages of team development. We want to move with care, proceed with care. Don't just add any old person. And don't just add people to boost your velocity. That's a bad, bad way to do things. Instead, you want to do it mindfully of the five stages of team development. And you want to make sure it's a good fit. And you want to make sure that the number of team members does not go beyond what is advised the sweet spot between three to nine as your agile practice guide and other documentation will tell you all right let's finally talk about the last one here in process it's closing close each stage iteration or phase with a retrospective or lessons learned just remember the retrospective is in the Agile Practice Guide talked about as the most important meeting, the most important ceremony in the world of Agile, pretty much, or you could say in the world of Scrum. The retrospective enables you to really do what is one of the hallmarks of, say, Scrum, for example, which is empiricism. Work the process, get better. Put your discoveries back in the pipeline and improve. That's the general idea. Let's move into the business domain. Here's our final one, business. When you're tackling the world of business on the exam, be prepared to hear words such as outcomes, value, benefits, revenues, advantage, demand, cost of delay. That's how you should be thinking, even if you don't have that exact one on the exam. Cost of delay, revenue leakage, opportunity erosion, competition, compliance, organization change, strategy, and business. All of these are topics and ideas you should be familiar with. Let's talk about these one by one. The first one here, environment. Observe and respond to the external and internal environment. So as a boundary spanner, someone who spans boundaries between your company and other companies, your company and the business environment, you absolutely should be observing and responding accordingly. And as a product owner, you should be adjusting your product backlog based on the environment. In the seventh edition, mention is made of the internal and external project environment, internal to the project, external to the project, and they pretty much rolled EEFs and OPAs into this internal, external thing. But you really do need to know, what is my job as a product owner? 
the exam is going to test you not just based on a project manager, but also based on a product owner interaction and a sponsor interaction and a team interaction. Okay, so environment is big. Next one, organization impact. Assess the organization's impact on the project and navigate accordingly as a project manager if the organization is having a huge impact on the project. You need to know how to navigate that. Next one is compliance. Proactively manage compliance. If you're not in compliance, it could be really bad. So expect questions that test your understanding and awareness of compliance and how to navigate it. On the exam, also expect the word outcomes to appear. Focus on outcomes, not deliverable, not output. Focus on outcomes. Is deliverable good? And important, yes, but that is not what you should focus on primarily. Your focus needs to be on the outcome. So think about value, benefits, and outcomes over output. You could get output, and the output could be right on point, but it may not lead to a desired outcome. I'll give you an example. If you're working on a software project to deliver software, and software implementation is really the end goal for people to use that software, for people to find value and benefit from that software. You deliver the output, which is a software, but no one's using it. No one's home. Everyone's using their own tiny little systems here and there. The real benefits of using this system that you've grown, people aren't realizing it. Therefore, they're not getting value. Therefore, it's an undesirable outcome because people are still wasting company time and money using a system that doesn't work as well as the one you've built. So what could you have done to ensure the outcome is realized? You could have some cut over built in so that people know on this day, this is going away. Take the system away because if you don't, they will never realize the benefits of the new one. So think about outcomes, and this is why you would add things to your backlog, such as add a cutover period, enforce a cutover period, and things like that. So the additional activities or backlog items that will help you realize the true outcome are things you should be thinking about. The exam will also test you on benefits. Benefit, value, outcomes, they go hand in hand. Proactively ensure the management of benefits and their realization. Highly advise that you read, in particular, page 33 of the PMBOK Guide 6th edition, and also read page 30, because the business case and the benefits management plan are pretty important. The next one is about sustainable community. Harness COPs, PMOs, and VDOs for the firm's strategic goals. It's all about the firm supporting people, building a community, building a sustainable community. Organization change. Set the stage for organizational change and build alliances. Use your network. Use your influence. Value swap. Swap out backlog items with work of comparable value, as opposed to having draconian procurement practices. How about reading page 77 in the Agile Practice Guide? Page 78, and understanding how we navigate procurements and contracts in the world of Agile. We swap things out, things of comparable size and value, and we work to achieve the customer's success and competitive business advantage, not by asking for change order upon change order, but instead working with them as flexibly as possible. Check out the flexible contract arrangements that exist on page 77 and 78 of the Agile Practice Guide. Next is lean thinking. Be lean. Think and be lean to eliminate waste at all levels of the value delivery system. You could say simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done, is essential. It's one of the Agile principles. Ten. Take a look at that. Understand being lean, being mean, being simple in your delivery. Simple as much as you can. Avoid complexity with thinking lean. 
project impact. Assess the project's impact on the organization and navigate accordingly. If your project is causing huge, huge change in the organization, you can expect pushback, you can expect backlash, and you need to be able to navigate that and be proactive by being a change agent. And ahead of time of those project changes, begin to use your influence across the firm to let people know the good things your project is actually going to do. Value delivery, this is huge. Strategically plan the value delivery system. The value delivery system is a term talked about in the seventh edition. It's definitely one you want to know. The value delivery system is a collection of portfolios, programs, projects, operations, and also the external and internal environments are documented there as well in the PMBOK guide, seventh edition. Finally, gated, use toll gates, stage gates, kill points, and phase end reviews to deliver only value. If you find that value is not going to be delivered, if you can detect from your backlog that value is not being delivered, then why don't you just shut it down? PMP exam mindset mantras. This encapsulates the way you need to think as a PMP, someone who is expected to be a leader, expected to be a decision maker, and one who understands the tools of the trade for project management. These 36 mantras will help you on your PMP exam to effectively think through the problems. Let's take a look at them one by one. The very first one is about people. This is a collection of 12 statements that fine tune your focus where people are concerned. Be familiar with terms such as team, customer, product owner, sponsor, stakeholder, program manager, portfolio manager, steering committee, functional heads. The first part of the mantra is about the customer. Make your customer success a primary goal. Advancement, work with a customer to move the project forward. Do not choose options that kick the can down the road. In other words, do not choose options that pass the buck to someone else. Your mindset needs to be passing the buck stops here. Fairness, treat others fairly and have empathy and be mindful and aware of diversity and inclusion. And be aware that inclusion has more to do with race, religion, and orientation. Inclusion is all about bringing people in so that they feel part of the team. Steward, protect resources entrusted to you. Treat those resources with care. Be a fiduciary of those resources. Team, focus on stakeholder and team health, well-being, and synergy. Remember, give the team the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Team trust. Trust the team. Trust their judgment. Allow them choose their way of working. If you get questions on the exam that give you an option of going against what the team thinks is the best option, don't choose that. No matter how appetizing it looks, let the team make their mind up for themselves, especially in an agile environment. Servant leader, defend the team, be a diversion shield and facilitate conflict resolution. Mentor, mentor, coach, serve and guide the team instead of using punishment and coercion. Do not fire the team members, but instead mentor and coach them to excellence. Integrity, do not abuse your position or title or be partial in your actions. One way we could be partial in our actions is favoring team members. On agile questions, remember that the best option for reward is rewarding the entire team, not just a few people on the team who, in quote, perform better. Honesty, be honest and truthful in all your dealings even if it may offend others. Leadership, be courageous to lead, make tough decisions and tough conversations and make trade-offs. If you have not paid close attention to pages 33 to 37, 
in the Agile Practice Guide, I would recommend that you do. Finally, in people, agility, be agile and adapt to be resilient. Let's move into process. Here we have knowledge areas, process groups, processes, formulas, methods, models, artifacts, theory, framework, and practices. You should be familiar with this lingo. Very first in process is all about the life cycle. Select and tailor the appropriate project life cycle and development approach. What do you do when you need frequent delivery but low degree of change? Or frequent delivery and high degree of change? Well, that's agile. Frequent delivery and low degree of change is incremental. How do you know these? Open up your agile practice guide and focus on pages 18 and 19. This will help you better understand the four life cycle types talked about. Incremental, iterative, predictive, and agile. And don't forget, a hybrid life cycle is also an option. Hybridize where necessary to maximize value and options. Have an agile mindset. Seek to deliver incrementally. Plan iteratively where possible. Be systematic and strategic. Think systematically and strategically to navigate complexity. In other words, think about the big picture and how the pieces interconnect. Change, manage change and configuration with intentionality. Change management usually deals with change requests. Configuration management may not necessarily deal with change requests to that level of detail, but an overarching understanding of what configurable items are on the project. The configurable items should have already been identified. And once those have been identified, our focus is on version control and upholding the systems that we have put in place to do so. Inspect and adapt. Continuously inspect and adapt and integrate all levels and layers. Problem solve is probably one that summarizes your entire exam. If you are not solving the problem, you are not answering the question properly. Solving the problem means not passing the buck and not saying no, but looking for a solution that moves the problem forward, that moves whatever circumstance it is, an issue, an impediment forward. So be a problem solver and offer solutions, not problems. Quality or the iron triangle. Proactively build in quality and manage the iron triangle. Schedule, cost, and scope. Have you ever heard of the iron triangle, schedule, cost, and scope? If you haven't, let's take a very quick look at it. The iron triangle sees schedule, cost, and scope. And an adjustment in any of those sides under most circumstances will necessitate some change on the other sides. So imagine quality being in the middle. Well, quality is impacted by scope and schedule and cost. If you want to increase scope, there could be a change to the schedule side and also the cost side. So this sensitizes you to always look 360 at what a change will do to any of these schedule, cost, scope, quality as well. Well, we don't stop there. Some people talk about a quadruple constraint and they talk about schedule, cost, scope, resources, and they put quality in the middle. And we could go on and on to a quintuple constraint and so on. But the bottom line is this, whenever you get a change request, make sure that you analyze and assess it from all perspectives. Risk and governance, proactively manage risk and governance, manage all areas. In other words, logically plan and manage all knowledge areas, 
buy-in and authorization is important, so seek it where necessary. And in closing, the closing process group, we close each stage, each iteration or phase with a retrospective or lessons learned. The bottom line is that process could get rather technical. So let's back up for a quick second and talk about how you need to be thinking in process. When you approach process questions, you need to remember that as you develop the project charter, this is the first step on any project. It is mandatory. It is one of those mantras that says, no charter, no project. No charter, you're not authorized. When you have your charter, the next thing that should happen is the planning activities. Now, of course, the planning activities are multiple planning activities. In fact, in the sixth edition of the PMBOK guide, you find 24 planning processes. Now, while the project charter is being developed, bear in mind you also have other things that come out of this process, such as an assumption log. These are things to be aware of. At the same time, in initiating, we could very well be thinking about the identification of stakeholders. This does not have to be in strict cookie cutter rotation. The logic is the moment the charter is developed, stuff can begin to happen. Stakeholders are continuously identified all throughout the project. Stakeholders are very important input to the topic of quality and the topic of risk because quality and risk could be rather perceptual. So we wanna invite our stakeholders into those conversations as early as possible. Before that, we would also invite our stakeholders into the topic of the collection of requirements. So understanding how these parts are interwoven is pivotal for your success in the process area. The summary is we have our charter, we have a plan and we begin to execute the work. And as we're executing the work, we're at the same time monitoring and controlling the work. And there's a feedback loop and it goes on and on until we get our desired output, which is an accepted deliverable. And that goes to the closing of the project. And then we have a transition to the customer. But bear in mind that executing is going to give you a deliverable that we will then inspect and it becomes a validated deliverable before we ultimately will get an accepted deliverable. Again, understanding how these parts are interwoven is pivotal for your success on the PMP exam process piece. Let's talk about the final piece here. It's the business piece. And this looks at outcomes, value, benefits, revenue, advantage, demand, cost of delay, revenue leakage, opportunity erosion, competition, compliance, organizational change, strategy, and business. These are all terms you could hear in this domain. The very first mantra is environment. You got to observe and respond to the external and internal environment. If you are a product owner, then you obviously need to be aware of the environment. Outcomes, focus on outcomes, value and benefits over output. By output, we could be referring to a deliverable. The outcome of the project is more important than the deliverable. The deliverable is a stepping stone towards the outcome, but it is not the outcome. The major outcome you're looking for is what happens after that deliverable is implemented and used. We get value, benefits are realized, and then the outcome. So what is value? It's the net quantifiable benefits that we derive from using whatever the project is meant to produce. And if we are realizing benefits, it will lead us to our desired outcome.
organizational change, set the stage for organizational change and build alliances. Stakeholder engagement is what this refers to. Project impact, assess the project's impact on the organization and navigate accordingly. Be aware of political landmines. Organization impact, assess the organization's impact on the project and navigate accordingly. So how does the organization affect the project? How does the project affect the organization? Next, we have benefits. Proactively ensure management of benefits and their realization. If you have not paid close attention to pages 33 and seven in the PMBOK Guide 6th edition, I highly urge you to. Value swap. Think about this as the dynamic scope option talked about around page 78. Swap out backlog items with work of comparable value. Now, when I say page 78, I mean the Agile Practice Guide, page 78. This is where you have different Agile contracts talked about. In fact, make a note to self, page 77 and 78 should be read. Value delivery. Strategically plan the value delivery system. The value delivery system is talked about at length in the PMBOK Guide 7th edition, but what it really means in a nutshell is the integration of projects, programs, and portfolios, along with the operational work to deliver value. Whatever value is, it's perceptual, but the project, program, portfolio, operation system enables you to deliver and realize that value. And that's what the value delivery system is. It has to be strategically planned, not just winging it, but actually deciding how to structure work. Remember, portfolio management is doing the right work. Project management is about doing the work right. Compliance, proactively manage compliance. You could be out of compliance and face stiff penalties. You do not want that. Sustainable community. Harness communities of practice, PMOs, project management offices, VDOs, value delivery offices used a lot in Agile these days for the team's strategic goals. Lean thinking. Think and be lean to eliminate waste at all levels of the value delivery system. And lastly, gating. Use toll gates, stage gates, kill points, and phase end reviews to deliver only value. If you are looking for help towards your exam, my friends, go on down to praiseon.com. We have different programs in Agile, in the predictive world, for the CAPM, for the PMP, and Scrum in general. Again, P-R-A-I-Z-I-O-N.com. Thank you very much for joining me. I wish you all the very best in all your endeavors and on the PMP exam. Hello, my friends, your buddy Phil here, project management trainer and coach. I hope you're doing well. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the PMP exam and taking a look at the most important things. Now, breaking news for the past number of years, I've always told you, Read the sixth edition, right? Know your ITTOs, know the process groups, stuff like that. Well, here's the deal. The reason why you need to do that is not really because of the exam. It is for your professional life as a project manager to enable you feel comfortable personally. I studied the PMBOK guide second edition twice. I went over it. That's what my exam was based on. And I read it twice. And I ended up reading the third edition as well in error about halfway. So I had read the PMBOK guide backwards and forwards. And that is what helped me on the exam to be able to cope with the language because when they write questions, they're going to bake in predictive language, agile language, hybrid language. So for the longest time, I have said, read the book. Now, 
in 2022, I have to be honest, I've heard a smattering of things from students, but I know you shouldn't focus your energies on memorizing, on cramming. It's not going to help you. What is going to help you is understanding the logic, understanding the general framework, and understanding the flow of stuff. Let me try my best in the next 30 minutes to summarize this for you such that if this was your final study day, the information I'm sharing with you here today will see you through. In fact, this video is for people who have got the exam coming up real quick and they're panicking and they're freaking out. This video is to calm your mind and to gently work in the logic, the logic that is in the sixth, the logic that is in the seventh, if you wanted to call it that, and the values and principles talked about on page eight and nine. So what I'm doing here is taking these three books and I am condensing them for you. Now, I have already done that in a book that is going to be released to the public very soon. Right now, it's only available to my students and it's called Project Management Layman's Guide. I have condensed tons and tons of pages into a very small book with 50 solid questions to get you into that mindset for the exam. So right now we're gonna cover the PMP exam mindset mantra. We're gonna spend some time getting into the mindset. Let's get started. I have broken this down into people. Let's talk about the people mindset. For the exam, you've got to be familiar and ready to see words such as team, customer, stakeholder, sponsor, product owner, program manager, and so on. The first thing you want to be thinking about is the customer. Be obsessed with the customer. Make your customer's success a primary goal. Always look out for the customer. Next, focus on the team. Focus on the stakeholder and their well-being and their health and their synergy integrity. Do not abuse your position or title or be partial in your actions. Make sure you choose those options where you're always taking the higher ground, where you are above board and everything you are doing is on point. Advancement. Always move the project forward. I cannot overstate this. This is by far one of the most important points for your exam. Always choose the option that moves the project forward. Let me give you an example. You get a question that says, you're a project manager that has a stakeholder that has refused to sign documentation. What should you do? And you've got A, report that stakeholder to their boss. What good does that do in the grand scheme? Then you have B, discuss with the stakeholder and understand their point of view. That is the better option. So any option that does not move the problem or the issue forward or advance the project, do not choose. Always choose the best option to advance the project. Team trust. Trust the team and their judgment. The questions will test you on understanding that the team should be self-organizing, autonomous, and you should believe the best in the team. Allow the team to choose their own way of working. Honesty. Be honest and truthful in all your dealings, even if it may offend others. Even if it seems like someone's going to be mad in the question, still go ahead, do it anyway. Fairness. Treat others fairly. Have empathy. Be mindful and aware of diversity and inclusion. So assume you're a project manager on a project and there's a team member that has been ostracized in some way by the other team members. What should you do? Should you just allow that team member to be all on their own? You find out that they're not including this person in discussions, in debate. You're realizing that the person is always isolated and they're not including the person in group activities. What should you do as a scrum master, as a servant leader, as a project manager? Remember, you are a coach, a mentor. So you need to mentor and coach these individuals into inclusion and diversity. 